Thank you all for being here. You are going to be changed, and you are going to be so grateful that you chose to be here. For those of you who are visiting with us through um, the streaming, live streaming, we welcome you to this space and to all of you streaming with us and everybody else in the room <clears throat> who perchance may not be on our mailing list. We send out an email blast every Thursday saying who is going to be here and what we're going to be talking about and what we're going to be doing inside church. So if you would like to be on that email blast, please give us your name. If you're streaming, please call in or fill out the information um, on the website. There, uh, there are clipboards over there with green sheets on it. Just fill it out. <clears throat> uh, today, we uh, put our faith into action, and our action today is to bring an end to uh, TV commercials for big pharmacy drugs. Uh, the American Medical Association has said that we need to put an end to this. It's dangerous, and so we're joining them, and we hope that you'll sign on. Go get more information at the action table and sign a letter to your Congress people, your senators. Now, um, we have available for purchase, and just in time to make the most perfect Christmas purchase in the world, um, the newest book by our speaker, and you'll hear more about that, but they are on sale right over there. Now, <clears throat> the fact of the matter is, is Christianity and all of religion are undergoing a revolution, and a lot of it is happening right here, and there's nobody in the world articulating it and informing us about it more effectively than today's speaker. Dinah Butler Bass is an author extraordinaire, a thinker of great profundity and insight and magnitude, and we are very happy to hear, have her here. She holds a PhD in religious studies from Duke University, author of nine books, including this one, she regularly speaks at conferences, consults with religious organizations, gets on the phone with people like me to give us advice and to tell us what's going on throughout the world. She writes at the Huffington Post, the Washington Post, and she comments on religion, politics, and culture with US Today, USA Today, Time, Newsweek, CBS, CNN, Fox, PBS, and NPR. Just to show you what a big tent person she is, she even comments on Fox. <laughs> <clears throat> she, after all, is an Episcopalian. From 95 to 2000, she wrote a weekly column on American religion for the New York Times Syndicate. She contributes for Sojourners magazine, written widely throughout the religious press, Christian-centric clergy journal congregations. She was the project director from 2002 to 2006 of a national Lilly Endowment-funded study of mainline Protestant vitality which was featured in Newsweek and many other national media platforms. Recipients of many, many grants and awards, which we don't have time. She has taught at Westmont College, University of California at Santa Barbara, McAllister College, Rhodes College, Virginia Theological Seminary, in everything having to do with what's going on in Christian thought and the changing religious thought. We are so very fortunate to have, and will you please warmly welcome our dear friend, Diana Butler Bass. Let her rip. Give us your most radical. <laughs> oh my gosh. I just love being here. Thank you so much, Ed, and it's wonderful to see both you and Susan and all of my friends who are gathered here in this room, and I hope uh, many online as well. Grounded, my new book, is my ninth book. I'm fond of saying that had I been born in the 19th century, I would have nine children and one book, <laughs> but as it is, it is the other way around. Uh, nine books and one uh, incredibly beautiful daughter. And in some ways, this book that I get so, I feel so honored to be with you today and, and share with you is, is my most radical. 
and uh, it is also the closest uh, book that I have ever written to my own heart, and perhaps the riskiest as well. A friend of mine says it is a work of urgent beauty and of prophetic spirituality. And instead of telling you about a book, I'm going to be like an author. I'm going to show and not tell. And so I'm going to take you right there to both the beauty and to the urgency and to try to make connections between the words that I have put on this page and the things that are in my heart and the painful uh, moment of our culture in which we live. So let me begin, and I begin in a place that many of you um, might know. The first chapter is called Genesis, and it begins with a little epigraph by someone many of us love, Wendell Berry, and the quote is, what we need is here. I am sitting in the center of a labyrinth at Mount Calvary, a monastery in Santa Barbara, California. The labyrinth, a walking path for prayer, is painted on a concrete patio in a garden behind an old building that now serves as a retreat house. At the edge of the labyrinth are native plants and flowers, including a bright purplish bush called woolly blue curls, where a hummingbird, oblivious to my presence, feeds. Crows, sacred to the Chumash people who once inhabited this place, fly from the gnarled branches of live oaks to the heights of eucalyptus trees as they caw and search for food. There is abundant bougainvillea, fragrant lavender and rosemary, bright mountain lilac, and coastal sunflower. Along the stone pathways are statues of the Virgin Mary and saints, often paired with benches for those who wish to sit in prayer-filled solitude. A dry, a creek, actually a dry bed due to California's extended drought, runs along the base of the hillside below where I suspect rattlesnakes make their home. This is a contemplative place. But oddly enough, it is not terribly quiet. Across the creek, school children play, cheering for their teams. Not far away, someone stands in back of a building talking on her cell phone. The museum nearby will open soon, and workers are making ready for the day. The sound of traffic on Los Olivas Street is muffled by trees and shrubs, but still obvious. Joggers on the road chat with one another during their morning run, and tourists talk behind the wall that separates the monastery from the mission next door. Neighborhood gardeners mow lawns and blow leaves. Mount Calvary has not always occupied this particular place. Years ago, I often visited its original location, 15 mostly vertical acres of mountaintop above Santa Barbara with sweeping views of the Pacific Ocean. When sitting on the porch on a clear day, you looked out towards the Channel Islands and down upon the city. There were distant sounds, voices traveling across canyons and the faint rumble of the freeway far below, like indistinct prayers rising to the skies. Mostly, it was quiet, stunningly so. The immediate silence broken mostly by birdsong bells or monastic chant, and so high up that otherworldly place felt a bit like heaven. But Mount Calvary's mountaintop paradise is no longer. In November 2008, the California winds blew hot and a wildfire destroyed it all. As the flames engulfed their home, the terrified monks fled downhill to the city. The sisters of St. Mary's convent, an order whose house sits behind the Santa Barbara mission in a busy residential area, took them in. At St. Mary's, the sisters and brothers lived together in probably what is one of the most awkward arrangements ever in the history of monasticism. Um, <laughs> sharing monastic community. Eventually, the monks received an insurance settlement for the old Mount Calvary and faced the decision of whether or not to rebuild on the top of the hill. After much prayer, they opted to sell the scorched site in favor of finding a different location. 
The sisters, with only a few women remaining in their small community, offered their property to the brothers. And thus, St. Mary's Convent became the new Mount Calvary, and the brothers took up permanent residence in the city. From the labyrinth, I look up and see the peak where the monks used to live. When they gaze down on the heights above, when they gaze down from the heights above, this spot would have been just a speck in their commanding perspective. A person sitting where I sit would have been invisible to them. Now they live in the world with everything right around them, no longer above it. They have become part of the view, not distant observers of it. If I think about what was lost, about the beautiful old monastery, I feel sad. I miss those majestic views, the vistas of mountain and ocean with their towering sense of being above the world. But here in the center of the labyrinth, peace prevails. The morning fog is lifting. I kick off my shoes. The sounds provide a kind of gentle companionship, reminding me that I am not completely alone with my prayers. Sitting on the ground, I feel a warm solidarity with the world of nature and the worlds of all those who are traveling nearby. And I feel that other presence as well, the heartbeat of love at the center of things the spirit of wonder or all that so many call God. And any sense of monastic isolation has been overcome with a sense of intimate connection with all that is around, things seen and things less tangible. I, like the monks, am not above. Here I am with the world. And I find that God is with me. This opening story of the book is not just about me sitting on the labyrinth, but is about all of us right now. The fire is sweeping up the mountains and that the buildings that we built and have invested so much of our time and energy in are, of course, threatened. We, like the monks, have to flee the fire. And we find ourselves coming off of mountains of faith, mountains that our ancestors tended and cared about, where they met God. And we find ourselves now in the city below, part of the view, here, in the world. What I have learned in the last few years is that the idea of coming off mountains is not such a bad thing. This story not only invites us all to consider the relocation of faith in our time, but it also invites us to consider the question that is underneath so much of our cultural anxiety at this moment. The question is occasionally talked about in the media. It certainly shows up in blogs. It is a question that our ancestors didn't really think to ask in the same way we are asking it today. And that is the question, where is God? Surely the brothers must have asked that when they had to flee their home and then it burned to the ground and they found themselves living in a strange new place, wondering what the future held for them and their practices and their communities. Where, where was God in the midst of all of that? But the place where we hear it more often in our own lives is when we turn on the television and something has happened. The moment that I think I noticed it with a sort of a, sh a, a new, shocking, transformative uh, a glimpse, a sort of vision, was the moment that followed the shootings in Newtown, Connecticut at Sandy Hook Elementary School. 
I don't know about you all, but the, the, the level of anxiety and horrible things that we have witnessed in the last decade have sort of mounted on top of one another like a, 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 a almost like unresolved PTSD. Is that the shock of 9-11, we didn't get over that before three months later we heard that the Catholic Church had actually covered up the most hideous kinds of sexual abuse against its youngest members. And that added into it, and then came things like Katrina and uh, the tsunami in Indonesia. And you think about these events one after another in an unrelenting string of tragedy and shock, none of them completely healed before the wound gets ripped off again. And then came Sandy Hook. For all of that awful stuff of the previous decade, for some reason, in 2012, when that event happened, I found myself in a place where I almost could not breathe. Because I could understand political terrorism, I could understand natural disaster, but I could not understand a human being taking guns into an elementary school and killing 25-year-olds. And that happened three years ago. And I'm not the only person who can't understand that because what I noticed was is that the internet kind of exploded with a question. A question that was once asked by Job when everything was lost and that there was nothing but suffering all around. And the question was, where is God? And all of a sudden, our fellow citizens were asking that question at coffee houses, in sermons, in blogs, and even on television shows. Where was God at Sandy Hook? Where was God? The thing that was so striking to me about that question is the courage it takes to ask it for the first sort of moment that it escapes from us. We realize that we are lost in the universe that we are living in a dislocated place, that somehow the fire has indeed chased us off of the mountains of comfort and familiarity. But the second thing that came to my attention is how different that question was from the questions that I had heard about God for so much of my life. For when my parents or my grandparents or probably their parents before them Face tragedy, for example, at the beginning of World War II or when the stock market crashed or going back to my great-grandparents when the Titanic sank, they did not ask the question, where was God? My immediate ancestors, your immediate ancestors, assumed they knew where God was. And that was in heaven. And what my parents and my grandparents asked in times of tragedy and public despair was not where was God, but instead they asked the question, what does God intend with this? Why is God letting this happen? Why doesn't God fix that? So notice what those questions are. Those are questions of divine intention. But divine location? Those were not the questions. God was in heaven. My mother, of course, being mid-century Methodist, used to love saying, God is in heaven and all is right with the world. Well, if God is in heaven, uh, somehow the second half of that is not working out right now. And uh, that was what what, what our grandparents thought. Except, of course, if your grandparents were Jews. Because in the middle part of the 20th century, These terrible things happened in Europe. The Holocaust and then, of course, the bomb. And there were some people who began to ask as early as the 1940s and the 1950s, where is God? People like Elie Wiesel and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. But those questions remained sort of in the corners of literary culture or prayer culture or theological culture and didn't really consume the rest of us. 
because for all of the shock and horror of the middle part of the 20th century, when many of our ancestors came home from fighting that big war, and they might have had questions about God's intention, not questions about whether or not God actually was alive, they quickly went back to normal. A gigantic revival swept over the United States, almost acting as if the events of the middle part of the century did not exist, building bigger churches and more white picket fences than ever. But those questions, those questions were always there. Where was God? For the rest of us, if we aren't Jewish, or we weren't schooled in death of God theology, we were able to ignore that God appeared to be missing until the last 15 years. And now we know that the primary question of our time is not why is God doing this to us, but instead the deep and powerful question, where is God? That is the urgency piece. The beauty is sitting in the labyrinth and knowing somehow in a deep, intuitive way, surrounded by the beauties of nature and the sounds of my neighbor, that God is indeed with us. But the urgency piece are those questions, the questions that are raised every time we turn on the news. Now, that is difficult stuff. Before I came over, I looked at the gospel readings, of course, for this morning, this the second Sunday of Advent, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Advent is actually about what grounded is about. It is about the coming of the deepest sort of beauty into the world, it is about finding God with us, even there in John the Baptist's prophetic proclamation. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain made low. It's about the harmony that will emerge in the natural world as we see and understand that God, Emmanuel, is truly with us. And then John says, and all flesh shall see God. It's about the natural world and the reordering of the natural world as God is with us, and it is about all flesh, all creatures, all of us, our neighbors, our families, our friends, our communities, the cosmos, seeing the power of God with us. And this vision is the transformative hope of Israel. This vision is the transformative promise of Jesus and the whole point of the New Testament. As I walk through the world to try to answer the question, where is God, which is the guiding and primary question of this particular book, because I felt that I had lost my grounding in God. I realized that I found God primarily in two places, and that was through the natural world and through my neighbor. And in Grounded, I take you into a journey of that discovery um, as a way of inviting you to discover how you encounter God in the world all around you, to find where and how Emmanuel has entered your own life and then to ask all of us as friends and communities the most important of all questions. How does this realization change us? How does it empower us? And throughout the book, the question, where is God, unfolds in these stages through the natural environment and through our neighborly relations with one resounding answer. If we really 
really, truly embrace this vision of an intimate God who is with us in all of the horizons of nature and human activity, we will be more compassionate people that we will have the power, the insight, the courage, and the passion to live our lives with empathy and love and to resist at every turn fear. It was an incredibly and amazing powerful book for me to write. In some ways, these 300 pages mark a conversion for me. I say that at the end of the book, that this is my third conversion, the first one from sort of my childhood faith to uh, evangelicalism as a teenager, which some of you here in this room uh, were with me actually on that part of the journey. And then uh, when I was in my mid to late 20s, uh, journey out of the sort of narrow confines of the evangelical religion of the 1970s to a far more embracing and uh, big view of God and church. And uh, some of you have read the book that I wrote about that called Strength for the Journey, which opens at a Eucharist here at All Saints. When someone handed me the bread and said, Body of Christ, Strength for the Journey, and I freaked out. <laughs> I thought it was heretical. And, uh, <laughs> and so uh, in your Eucharist, I encounter this entirely different vision of what was going on with bread and wine and God and Jesus. And you so scared me that I went on a 20-year journey to figure it out. And that 20-year journey, as you know, I've been writing about, and it resulted in a sort of passionate embrace of the liberal mainline Protestant community in the United States. Well, I've been going on a quieter journey in the last decade or so, a journey where I have been asking myself is, will, will this do? Is there a bigger community, an even bigger view of God, one that escapes the beautiful walls of the church, not to burn those walls down, but instead to walk out into a fear-filled world with the most confidence and courage that possibly I can summon. And that's what Grounded is about. This third conver conversion, which is not a conversion away from anything. My first two conversions were away from something but rather a conversion to bring all of the past into the living present of my own life and a conversion toward the world. To come off of the mountain of faith where everything was so familiar and comfortable and instead live in the world around me. Oh, gosh. Yes. 12 minutes for questions. <laughs> um, I am so happy to be able to share this with you um, because my journeys always seem to get kick-started when I'm at All Saints. We're going to have some microphones pass around the room. Okay, let's stir it up and ask the most radical questions you can. <laughs> let's keep going, keep going on the conversion. Who has a question? Uh, there's a question over here. Oh, perfect. Uh -huh. Thank you. So exciting to hear uh, from you today. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you think that the place you're describing yourself to be at now is a place in which you've moved the question from uh, locating God, where is God? to uh, how am I bringing God into this situation? Thank you so much. Um, actually, in, in this chapter, which I read from, is the very beginning chapter of the book, and I, I actually say that the questions of the old world, whether it was the old world of my childhood religion, the old world of evangelical religion, or interestingly enough, uh, the old world of liberal Protestantism, uh, the questions in all three of those worlds were, who is God and what must I do to please God? And essentially, uh, 
all of my religious experience up until about maybe 10 or so years ago was really about the same God, and that was a God who lived way up here in heaven who was far off. And the primary problem that any of us had, if that's, where, if, if that's who God was, and I kept changing what that God looked like. You know, when I was little, it was an old man on a throne. When I was an evangelical, it was a very scary judge with a sentencing book. Uh, when I was a liberal Protestant, it was a gentle, loving-looking God who was trying to draw the whole of the world to uh, herself. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but God was still here. And so who is God, and then what must I do to please God? That changed quite radically in each one of those three settings. The question that I'm asking now is, where is God? And the answer that I explore here in this book is God is with us on the horizons of human experience and nature. And then the next question, and it's actually written in the book, is how does this change everything? How does this enliven our actions here in the world? And so we've moved from who and what, who and what do we do to please that God, towards where and how. Let me ask you a question. It's beautiful. So uh, I, I'm so resonant with what you're saying in terms of a, a conversion to a much, 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 much bigger God. Um, so Friday night, I uh, was a Jew and went to synagogue here for a farewell experience and praying in the Sabbath for um, Rabbi Joshua Levine Grader, who's leaving his rabbinate uh, here in Pasadena. And this, then last night I was a Muslim. I went to the Muslim Public Affairs Council and uh, preached and prayed there. And because of this place, it was so easy for me to know God in those places as being the very same God is here. And here comes my question about community. This is a question about mm -hmm. community. Is um, we've kind of made it easy for all of us to feel hyphenated. You know, I'm a mm -hmm. Jewish Muslim Christian. And I think most folk, I'm, I'm a Jewish Muslim Christian, and most people here are, I think, or, or got some kind of hyphen going on in their life. And we really like that. We, we are kind of a community of hyphenated people. Right. Um, what, what are the therefores that you are feeling and, and observing and writing about in terms of community life? Because it's easy to say God is in nature and God is in my neighbor, and I really believe that uh, in all of my neighbors. And I still need a community that gives me the courage to live that out. So if you could talk about the community aspect. Um, one of the things that I think is, is incredibly important in this reorientation, this relocation, is that it does help us. Um, in some way as human beings, if we have that community, if we have a set of what I would call shaping stories that hold us to account of one another. And so I completely understand myself as a Christian, but what I don't understand myself anymore as a Christian who thinks that my sort of elevator up to the vertical God is the only legit way of getting there. And so I am very able to sort of move around the world as you do. And I'm very happy with the, with the hyphenations. Uh, but I also am very gently aware that it would be wrong, I think, of many of us to be colonizing other religious traditions uh, with uh, our sense of theology or our sense that, um, you know, it's, it's all really sort of a jolly world and we're all kind of one, is that we have to, whatever we're doing next, we have to figure out a way for those of us who are Christians to be fully, beautifully, absolutely Christian in this sort of new 
spiritual economy, while Muslims can do the same, and Jews can do the same, and Buddhists can do the same, and there are plenty of hyphenated people by birth right now, um, and families that are hyphenated by marriage, where those, those, those people can do the same as well, where we are holding on to and retelling our stories in new and beautiful settings and in non non-exclusive but friendly ways. And see that, I don't know how that's all gonna work out, but I know we've been making it. And um, what I have some hope with is that in another 25 or 30 years, and I hope that both of you and I um, are here to witness it all, and I'm, I'm confident we will be, um, is that I think that our children and our grandchildren are gonna figure it out better than we can. And so what our job is right now is to open the space, as it were, and to begin to provide a new and different set of stories uh, while passing on what we think is the richest part of our traditions and our rituals and our practices uh, to help them to navigate the new um, emerging sort of place. So, so I don't have a real clear answer to your question, but community is absolutely important. And I don't want us to give up, uh, those of us who are Christians, I, I don't want us to give up on Jesus or the Jesus stories at all. And uh, since you've read the book, you know that I, what I do here is I open these stories up in different ways. And I also tell stories from other traditions. And this fall, I've been having great fun. My favorite sermon that I've been preaching has been on from Exodus chapter 3 when Moses uh, goes up to the mountain and, and meets uh, God in the burning bush. And the sermon title that I've been uh, using with that is, When a Spiritual but Not Religious Moses Meets God on the Mountain. <laughs> so anyway, um, I, I'm just excited about what will come out of this. And I think that that's, all, that's the best we can do right now. One last question. I got it. I got it. Sorry. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Okay. So. Um, Where is it? Right here, right here. Oh, there you are, okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm wondering, did you think that maybe we should reject the idea of God, that uh, God, religion has a bunch of horrors and you've described them? Yes. I think that that perception of religion as an evil force in this, in the world, Mm -hmm. is held probably by those who are spiritual but not religious. Um, I'm not saying reject the idea. We have of a real short time. Okay, reject the idea of spirit, mm -hmm. but of particularly of an all-powerful God. Yes, I actually reject that God outright in the first chapter of the book. I call that um, turning away from the omni-God, uh, the omnipresent, omni omniscient, uh, God who I learned about in seminary and I said perhaps it's time for the inter-God, inter the God who is the interweaving the threads between all of life, the intra-God, the God who connects all things. And so um, I, there I'm drawing off of a quite a large body uh, of contemporary spirituality and theology. Um, but all of this is done in such a way that I use one theological term in this entire book. And the rest of it is stories and prayers and uh, experience. And uh, my husband said after I wrote the book, he said, what you've done here is you've given people a gigantic permission slip uh, to feel affirmed in the ways in which you find God in your life and world. And that is where the spiritual revolution is. Us, us taking up this story, storming heaven, pulling the old, far away, distant, all powerful God off of that throne saying that is not going to do anymore, but not rejecting God. Because just because we put God in the wrong place doesn't mean that God isn't. Let me take this last question, Bob. Uh, another question that gets asked is, is what's his plan? I mean, why, why, why is she allowing uh, all of this? Given the fact right. that God is present, what's, the, what's going on? I mean, why does he sit there and watch the Holocaust? That's correct. And San Bernardino. And San that is exactly correct. That's the old question. And what it's led to is exactly what this gentleman said. If we hold on to that God, 
and God is all powerful and all this horrible stuff happens from the Holocaust up to San Bernardino. Um, if all that's happening, our God is a monster. Because what kind of God sits in heaven and watches all this kind of stuff unfold and does nothing about it if that God is indeed a powerful being? Um, and so basically, I would say at the sort of heart of this cultural divide we have right now is actually a theological problem. It's actually a problem about how we understand God. And there are whole bunches of people who are trying to reinforce this vertical vision and, and reproclaim this distant God and say that everybody who doesn't believe in this and that God are heretics and infidels, et cetera, whether it's sort of fundamentalist Baptists down the street, who thankfully don't usually have nuclear bombs, um, but, um, or a terrorist group on the other side of the world from whatever religion it happens to be, um, or those of us who are moving in this direction as Ed was describing so beautifully. And that's where the argument in the world is right now. It's between that vision of God and this vision of God. And if we don't get that right, we're cooked. The history hangs in, that an in the answer there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Diana Butler-Bass. Really wonderful.